Uh, We'll begin reading at verse 24, and we'll read to verse 31. And this takes place after the resurrection, and one of the disciples was not there when Jesus appeared to the others and said, I won't believe, and we will see the experience that he goes through and what Jesus says to him. So John 20, beginning at verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not there, not was, with, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So thus far in the book of John, and then we're going to turn to Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans 10, and we'll read verses 1 through 13. So Romans 10, beginning at verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, that is the people of Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the Scripture says, everyone who believes in Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is God's Word. So let's now turn to our Heidelberg Catechism lesson, Lord's Day 7, and if, you're, if you've got a book of praise, you can find that in the book of praise on page 523, page 523 of your books of praise. So Lord's Day 7, we are continuing to look at our deliverance from our sin and misery, we're starting to get to know more about our mediator, and in our previous Lord's Day lesson that Dr. Van Dam gave last week, we were were shown the mediator, Jesus Christ. And so Lord's Day 7, 
begins our confession here. So this is our confession question. Are all men then saved by Christ just as they perished through Adam? Answer, no. Only those are saved who by a true faith are grafted into Christ and accept all His benefits. Question, what is true faith? Answer, true faith is a sure knowledge whereby I accept as true all that God has revealed to us in His Word. At the same time, it is a firm confidence that not only to others but also to me, God has granted forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness, and salvation out of mere grace only for the sake of Christ's merits. This faith, the Holy Spirit, works in my heart by the gospel. Question, what then must a Christian believe? Answer, all that is promised us in the gospel, which the articles of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith teach us in a summary. What are these articles? Answer, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This is our confession. So, brothers and sisters in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the question that our confession begins with here is, is a good one. Are all people saved? So, all people are lost in sin because of Adam, but now because of Jesus, are all people saved? Is He the mediator for everybody? Now, some people will argue that. Those are, we, we call them universalists. They will look at texts like John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever might believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. They, they point to Ezekiel 33. They point to 1 Timothy 2, 2 Peter 3. These are passages that, that speak about God not taking pleasure in the death of the wicked and that He takes pleasure in the repentance of a sinner. And so their answer is that God wants everybody to be saved and they will be saved. But the answer of Scripture to that question, are all men saved, is clear. Not all people are saved. Ezekiel, the book they refer to, Ezekiel speaks of those who will die for their sin. The Apostle John, both in the Gospel of John and in 1 John 1 and 2, speaks of those who will be condemned be left in their condemnation. Paul, in in Romans 1, speaks of the wrath of God coming on those who, who do not believe. Peter speaks about God's wrath, about judgment. It's clear from Scripture that not all people will be saved. All have been lost in sin, but not all will be saved in Jesus Christ. You know, it may pain us to say it, and we take no pleasure in it. And for some of you, this may come especially close to home when you have those that you love who do not know Jesus or who reject Jesus, that you know that they stand before the God who is there, the God who called the universe into being, and they stand there without Jesus. But Scripture is clear. Not all will be saved. 
You know, Paul wishes that his Jewish brothers and sisters would be saved. We read that Romans 10, the beginning of Romans 10. You know, my heart, my just, he just longs for it. He even speaks they have a knowledge, but it's not. They don't know the reality of the gospel, of God's righteousness. So all men fell in Adam, but not all men are saved. The way down and the way back up are not the same. There is something needed, something that determines whether people are saved. And so our confession answers that question. That's what this Lord says about. But notice, this is something we always need to point out as we look at at this confession here in Lord's Day 7. When you look at the answer, there are two ways to answer the question. And Christians have answered it in those two ways, and both ways are correct. The one answer is to say, who are saved? And that answer is only those who are elect to salvation. And Lord's Day 7 could have said that. Who are saved? Only those whom, and we, we read that in the Belgian Confession, talks about election. The Canons of Jordan, another one of our confessions, speaks a great deal about election. But the Catechism does not. It could have said, all those who God determined from the beginning of time to save from sin, those will be saved. But, and that's a true answer. God has determined to save people. If it, wasn't, if it was left to us, we, we wouldn't respond in faith. God in His love does pull people, draw people powerfully to Himself. But what our Heidelberg Catechism does is it focuses not on God's eternal decree of whom He's going to save. The true perspective, He focuses on our response. Or the, the Heidelberg Catechism focuses on our response. It's important to see this because it is an area where people struggle in their experience of faith. And perhaps you're here today and you've had questions about that. When you want to answer the question of who will be saved you, and you want to answer it from the perspective of election, what you are trying to do is look at the issue from God's perspective. So you want to get round and see how God sees it. How do I know if I'm saved? Well, I have, to be, I have to know if I'm elect. I have to know God's plan for my life. And then what happens is you begin to look for signs that God truly does love you. Signs that you truly do have faith. Do I have real faith? I mean, what if I want to believe, but God actually hasn't elected me? Like, I can try as much as I want. I just want to be saved. And I... But if I'm not elect, then what's the point? And sometimes for those who, who attempt to look at, at, election, or at, at whether or not they are saved, whether or not they have faith from the, from the perspective of election, they begin to look for evidences of some sort of testimony in their hearts. They begin to look at the quality of their faith. They begin to... To, to want some sort of message, some sort of indication from God that their faith is genuine. And Lord's Day 7 doesn't do that. Lord's Day 7 looks at it from the perspective of our response. Who shall be saved? Only those are saved who by a true faith are grafted into Christ and receive His benefits. Only those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we call covenantal language. The promises of the gospel are spoken. Do you notice that in Scripture? All of Scripture is one large story. It's a story about God speaking His promises and calling people to respond that's the way God works. That's the perspective that God gives us. He doesn't say, hey, let me, I'll give you a little hint. 
you're probably elect. I'm going to give you maybe little, little signs that will leave for you that you're elect. It, the, the Scriptures is not about some sort of doctrine of God's sovereignty and God's electing love where, where you just are, you know, if you're elect, you're saved. No, God gives us the perspective of covenant. I am your God. You are my people. I love you. I've saved you. Here's the promises. Now respond. We read the Ten Commandments a few moments ago. That's God's covenant law. He tells us who He is, tells us to respond. Now, we know from the first part of the Heidelberg Catechism that we are in and of ourselves unable to follow that. We are sinners. We need to be saved. And how are we saved from our inability to follow God, to love God as we ought? We're saved through Jesus Christ, through faith in Him. That's the call that comes to us. Hear the promise and believe. It doesn't take away from God's sovereignty. It doesn't take away from the doctrine of election. We can talk about election another time. But right now, the point here is faith is the instrument that God uses. Now, I can't call you to, to be elect from the pulpit. I cannot stand here and say, be elect, or I hope you're elect, or if you're elect, this message is for you, for the rest of you. Thanks for coming out. But as a preacher, I can stand here and proclaim the promises of the gospel and call you to faith, to believe. And then God in His grace, by the Spirit, may use that. It's the only way we're saved. We look to the one who died for us, who gave us life. And so we're going to look at faith, what faith is, how we receive faith, what it looks like in our lives. Because if faith is the way in which God saves us, we want to know what it is and how we, how we receive it, what it looks like when we do have it. And so that's what we're going to do today. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see tr- what is true faith. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to kind of break it up. We're going to look, first of all, at the function of true faith, just in terms of just kind of working out how faith actually would be something that would be connected to us being saved and then we're going to look more closely at, at what faith is and, and the content of faith. But so let's begin with the function of faith. Because our faith is not actually the thing that saves us. It's important to understand. It's not the basis of our salvation. Christ is the basis, the ground of our salvation. Faith is the instrument that God uses whereby we receive Christ. You look at Article 22, the Belgian Confession, it it explicitly says that. Therefore, we do not say that faith is the basis for our salvation because otherwise then we, our act of believing, would be what saves us. No, It's Jesus Christ who saves us, and we're connected to Him. I've used this illustration before. I've used it with the catechism students. In fact, even when we were doing the interview for catechism students, I think two of the students actually recounted this illustration to explain what faith is. But it's a a well-known illustration from, from John Piper. And and by the way, if you're if you're at home, you can look at look at this after the service, or if you Google. Carson, and blood of the lamb. I think if you just enter those keywords, you'll see a little short video of, a, of a, a Canadian theologian who's also Reformed, but he's Baptist, but, so he's Canadian and Reformed, but not Canadian Reformed. But he is speaking about the experience of Jews on the Passover. It's a wonderful, so that's extra, extra credit. You can do that after the service. But how Piper explains it is, imagine you have a cliff, and there's a fire here, and it's coming closer and closer to the edge of the cliff, and and then somebody says, you can't see see over the cliff, you don't know what's down there, it's kind of foggy, and they say, there's water down there, if you jump, you'll be saved from the fire. And so one person's like, I'm going. And he jumps off the cliff and he goes into the water. 
Other people are like, that's ridiculous, and they die in the fire. And then finally, the fire is coming closer and closer, and there's this one guy left. He doesn't know what to do, looks at the fire, and then he just kind of lets himself fall off the edge of the cliff. And then Piper's question is this, and it's a beautiful question. What is the difference between the first person who boldly jumped off the cliff and the person who just fell off the cliff at the last minute? Not a single thing. Because what saved them was not the way in which they jumped, but the fact that there was water and safety below the cliff. And the same question, and when you, if you watch the Carson video, it's powerfully put about being saved by the blood of the Lamb. You're not saved by the strength of your faith. You're not saved on the beauty of your faith. You're saved by the object of your faith, Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you, you, you feel like, I just don't have a strong faith, the function of your faith is not the thing that makes you right with God in the terms of, you know, if I have a strong faith, I'm so much better. I'm saved because I've done it so well. You're saved because you're connected to Jesus Christ. Romans 10, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You're connected to Jesus Christ. That's what faith does. It joins you to Him. The image that's used in Scripture is, is we call it union with Christ. We, we, you look at John 15, for instance, Romans 11, uh, verses 16 to 21, where you have this image of being grafted into the tree. You, you have branches that are grafted into a tree, and then John Calvin famously puts it this way, faith is evidence of the graft that's there connecting you to the tree. It's not branches that have life in themselves that happen to park themselves in a tree. No, it's tree, it's branches that are grafted into the tree that is Christ and receive life from Christ. So what is the function of faith? John 21, we read it, 20, we just read it a few moments ago. That by believing in Jesus Christ, you might have life in His name. You're dead. You join to Christ by faith. And through faith, join to Jesus Christ. All that is His is yours. That's the function of faith. We're joined to Him. And being joined to Christ, we have His life. It's a work of the Spirit. And what happens is we, we don't graft ourselves in, but God grafts us into Christ. He opens our hearts. For instance, you think of, of Lydia. We, we, had a, we preached on this a, a few months back. The conversion of Lydia in Acts 16. Paul preaches the gospel and then the Lord opens her heart and she believes and she is then grafted into Christ by faith. She believes and she has life in His name. And it's a work of God. It's passive in the sense that we don't graft ourselves. It's done to us. But at the same time, it's something that we're called to do. It's the tension of the gospel. Believe. The call comes to you earnestly and sincerely. You don't hear the call and go, well, I hope God makes me believe. The means by which God works is through the preaching of the gospel. We see that in Romans 10. And if, you, if, if we would have read on a little further in Romans 10, he would have gone through the whole process of how people come to hear and about preachers being sent and, the, and, and hearing the good news. And then verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith is, is something that is worked in us, but it's something that we are called to do. And by the Spirit, God works new life in our hearts and we respond. But do you understand the way God works is through the means of me right now telling you this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believe. So 
So faith is not simply a dead thing, sort of a declaration we make or a payment that we make that somehow shifts us from guilty to innocent. It's this action worked in us by the Holy Spirit that connects us to Jesus Christ. And when we become connected to Him, we, we, we cry out praises to God. There's a, a well-known article or well-known book written. It was, it was a Dutch book. And I remember my professor in seminary had referenced it somewhere in the Dutch. And I don't know Dutch, as many of you know, especially our older members who are Dutch. And I thought the title of the book was Klank and Kerplunk. And I remember asking him about that book. And he's not a laughing person, but it was an outright, unconstrained chortle from him. He, I think the Dutch word is klank and verklank. So if you're Dutch and you're here, you know that. But it means sound and resound, or sound and echo. And how Trimp, this professor of theology in the Netherlands, put it, is that how it works is that God in the covenant speaks His promises and the promises, they come into the, the echo chamber of our heart. Like with a guitar, has a, you, you strum the notes and it echoes inside and goes out. You have it with this organ, the, the sound goes through there and it echoes out. God speaks His promises into our hearts. It echoes in our hearts and then rebounds back, resounds back to Him in praise. That's what faith does. Faith joins us to Christ, gives us life, re-echoes the promises in our hearts, and we respond in faith and praise to God. So that's the function of faith. So when you're talking about how can faith make me right with God, well, it joins you to Jesus Christ. That's its function. That's how God uses it as an instrument, and it's a beautiful thing that He does. An act of God where He regenerates us, gives us new life, and we believe. So then what is faith then? Because we've been talking about faith in terms of kind of walking around it, talking about how it's our response and how it functions. But what is it actually? At the end of the day, you could be listening, you're like, yeah, but what is it? And how do I know if I have it? So what we have in, in Lord's Day 7 is, the, is a... Is a an explanation of what is true faith that is based in a number of places from Scripture. But faith is really two parts, and the two parts belong together. One is a sure knowledge, and the other is a firm confidence. And you have that, for instance, Hebrews 11 speaks of this when it talks about faith. It says, now faith is the assurance, this is Hebrews 11, 1, Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So, faith is this knowledge, but also this assurance, this confidence. So, when you think about what faith is, and you have to keep these two together, but on the one hand, it's knowing the gospel, knowing God's Word. We hear God's Word And we know that this is the true story of the world. And it's not just cold knowledge. Because you know who has knowledge? Satan knows more than all of us. The demons know more than all of us. In fact, if you go through the Gospel of Mark, it's actually fascinating. The most accurate and just theologically accurate descriptions of Jesus Christ come from demons. The first miracle that Jesus does in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 1, 21, He comes up to a man, and then verse 24, this man with an unclean spirit, a demon, He yells out through the demon, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. He knows exactly who Jesus is. He's the first person to actually tell everybody else who Jesus is. He knew who Jesus was before the disciples knew who Jesus was. 
But that's not faith. That's not true faith. That's just simply knowledge of who God is. At the end of time, everybody will know that God is there. And they will hate Him and fear Him. So faith is a sure knowledge where we know this is true. And it's not simply something that hits the head, it it hits the heart. It's something that we hear from God in His Word, His revelation. It's not something where we kind of have a vague feeling about who God is and we kind of know He's kind of there and we just kind of, that's our knowledge. No, we know from His Word He speaks And it's a knowledge where the heart is just drawn towards God. This is who you are. You're beautiful. And I'm drawn to you. But at the same time, it's a confidence. It's an assurance. There is this idea sometimes where you can acknowledge the fact of the gospel And it's like you're halfway there, but now you just have to put trust in it and be assured of it and have your heart gripped with love and joy. That distinction is a false distinction. It's impossible to actually know that this is the true story. For us as human beings to say this is the true story and to say I have half faith. I almost have true faith because I know all the stuff, but it doesn't give me joy and I don't actually put my trust in that story. I don't put my trust in God, in Jesus Christ. That's not faith. That's passing a a history test. That's, that's, That's knowing the content. When you know that this is the true story of the world, and you believe in Jesus Christ, that truth penetrates the heart. We cannot ignore such great a salvation. True faith is something that touches the heart. And it's a truth that means everything else has to be changed. It's one of the things that is difficult sometimes to hear. And I know many of you have friends or family members who will say this. You'll ask them if they believe in God after they stop going to church or sort of drift. Like not a lot of people leave the church saying, I completely renounce God. There are people that do that. But a lot of people will just kind of drift where God becomes just kind of someone who's there. And you ask them, do you believe in God? And they say, oh, oh yeah, I I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But it doesn't impact their life in any way. They don't entrust themselves to Him. They don't, they don't act as though it is the fact. If I told you there was a, a bomb under this pulpit, it's going to go off in about five seconds. I hope none of you believe me. I hope none of you believe me. But if you did believe me and you sat the same way that you are now, what would that mean about the level of faith that you have in my statement? Faith is knowing the story, knowing that it's true, hearing all the promises of the gospel, and then saying, And that's all true for me. That I have salvation from my sins in Jesus Christ. All my sins are washed away. God my Father loves me. And I am so precious and dear to Him. I am righteous in Jesus Christ. He has allowed His own Son to suffer and die for me. And He's going to bring me to Himself at the end of time. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth where we will live in perfect righteousness with Him, free from sin, the way we were meant and made to be in creation. That's the story. And I believe it's true for me. 
And it gives me a joy and a confidence and a trust. And so I, I ask you, when you think of faith, is it just content for you? And what I mean is, when you look at your life, the way you respond to life, the, the way you interact with people, how you view worshiping God, do you trust Him? In the middle of COVID, do you trust Him? That I belong to the God who made heaven and earth, who holds this world in His hands, who loved me so much He gave His Son, that I know there's sin in the world, but He's done something about it. And I completely trust Him. Whatever is going to happen, wherever we're going, whatever's going to happen in the next six months, whatever's going to happen in the next year, I know I'm in His hands and I trust Him. I sometimes get the sense that as Christians, we understand that God is all-powerful. We have these ideas about God. But when it comes down, when the rubber hits the road, we don't actually trust that. We trust our efforts, we trust our money, we trust our relationships, we trust our reputation. But we don't actually trust that story because that's just kind of a side story. But faith says, no, this is the story. This is the true story of the world. And it means that I find myself in that story and I believe it's true for me and I trust and entrust myself to it. Thomas needed to see Jesus. He needed to see Him in order to believe. And when he did see Him, he was undone. When he saw the true story of the world standing in front of him, he says, my Lord and my God, just a beautiful confession. But Jesus said, you know, blessed are those who don't see and believe. And then John tells us, this is written so that you might believe that Jesus is a Christ and by believing have life in his name. That's faith. Trusting that your life comes from Christ. We receive the promises. And so the question then comes to you as well. You might be here this morning or maybe you've had moments in your life where you wonder, is my faith actually true? It's a difficult question sometimes, isn't it? What if I just believe because my parents believe? What if I just believe because... Everybody else around me believes, and if I don't believe, I lose that community. What if I believe because it's all I know? Do I have true faith? Or perhaps you're here and you're, you say you believe, but when I talk about trust, you go, but I, yeah, I know it's the true story, but I... I just can't trust it as much as other people do. I, and I stumble. Or perhaps you, you believe it's the true story, but when you look at your life, you realize that you're doing all kinds of things that act like that story is irrelevant. And you say, I, I want to believe, but I'm not sure if I do. Like, what do you do then? Is the answer, well, just try harder? Go to church more? Pray more? Read your Bible more? The answer is difficult, but also magnificently simple. God has promised in His Word, to work in you through the preaching of the gospel. It doesn't mean if I have weak faith, man, I'm going to listen to a sermon every day and then I'm going to, I'm going to get faith. 
and all my doubts will be gone. No, God has promised to you that these are the means through which I work. Doesn't mean it's a guarantee. Doesn't mean that you can somehow make yourself believe by coming to church. But God has said, this is the place where I work. I work all kinds of different ways. I'm not bound to only use those two means. The preaching of the word and the sacraments and being assured of the the gospel through the sacraments, Lord's Supper and baptism. But we are bound to them. God says, I will work through them. It's a beautiful, one of my favorite confessions is from the Canons of Dort, chapter 1, article 16. And it's responses to the doctrine of reprobation. And some of you may have children and family members who have drifted from the faith. Where their faith is like the guy that just kind of lets himself fall off the cliff at the end. And they hear the doctrine of reprobation, that they'll be left in their sin and face the judgment of God. And that confession asks, there are some, I'll read it, Canons of Dort, chapter 1, article 16, page 568, some do not yet clearly discern in themselves a living faith in Christ an assured confidence of heart, peace of conscience, a zeal for childlike obedience, and a glorying in God through Christ. Nevertheless, they use the means through which God has promised to work these things in us. They are not to be alarmed when reprobation is mentioned, nor to count themselves among the reprobate. Rather, they must diligently continue in the use of these means, fervently desire a time of more abundant grace and expect it with reverence and humility. Others seriously desire to be converted to God, to please Him only, and to be delivered from the body of death. Yet they cannot reach that point on the way of godliness and faith which they would like. They should be even less terrified by the doctrine of reprobation, since a merciful God has promised not to snuff out the smoldering wick, nor to break the bruised reed. What a beautiful confession from Scripture. That if you're struggling, if you're here today and you're struggling in your faith, if you're listening, if you're watching, and you feel so so weak, so small, God says, come and hear my promises again. Keep hearing them, because I work there. So come and hear Him speak. And what faith does is it's a fixation on the promises, not on the the act of faith. If If you stand and you spend all your time inspecting your faith to see if it's strong enough, looking for evidence of your faith, you're not looking at Christ, you're looking at yourself. Keep looking at Christ. Hear the promises proclaimed to you about who He is and what He's done. And God says, that's the way I work. You fix your eyes on the promise. Faith fix its eyes on the promise. And then the experience of faith follows. Don't look back to see if experience is there because you'll lose sight of the promise. And then finally, in conclusion, there is also sort of a two part division of faith that faith is both an action and something that has a content. And what we're going to do over the next few months is we're going to be working our way through the Apostles' Creed. Because the confession asks, what what is is faith? It's a sure knowledge and a firm confidence. And then what must we believe? In the answer, everything. The articles of the Christian faith. The articles of our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith which are taught in a summary, and then you have the Apostles' Creed. This creed has been spoken for thousands, 2,000 years. It's based on what's called the Old Roman Creed. It's from around 100 years after Christ. 
What would happen is that catechumens, the, the people who were, came to the faith, they would, as they were being baptized, they would actually say this Roman creed. And it's expanded. It's now called the Apostles' Creed. It's not written by the apostles. It's the faith of the apostles. But what you have, there is this, this content of faith, which is the gospel of who God is. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's something that connects us to a community, connects us to each other. We're bound by that faith, but we're also connected to a community that, spaces, that, that spreads over time and space. Oftentimes, when I introduce the creed in the afternoon, we say in the afternoon, let us now together with the church of all times and places. We're saying this creed, the articles of our Christian faith, in unison with billions of Christians all over the world and all throughout time. It's a beautiful picture that when you stand, we, and we don't recite the creed as much, but that's the way it traditionally was done. Singing didn't start till the 60s. So, but... We say the creed in unison. That's typically how it's done. And it's said together with the voices of Christians all over time and all over the world. What a beautiful picture. What must a Christian believe? The articles of our Christian faith. Those who believe come to see who God is. They confess their faith in Him. And they have life in His name. The church united by this faith. And so we look forward to looking at this Apostles' Creed, the articles of our Christian faith over the next few months, breaking down who God the Father is, who Jesus Christ is, the forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit, the church. We look at what we believe. True faith, the action of believing of being sure and and trusting yourself and trusting the God whom you profess. Amen. Let's now sing as we respond to the gospel. Let us sing as the gospel resonates in our hearts. This is a beautiful song. Speak, O Lord. We'll sing all three verses. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word.